Hi, my name is Rachel Andrews. Welcome to Everyday Athlete. On this week's video, I thought we'd look into the little known phenomena of SIPE, that swimming induced pulmonary edema. It's something that's really quite rare, but it would be really helpful if more of us knew what to do if we saw it or felt it in ourselves, because it is potentially fatal. Anyway, I've been joined by Dr. Ruth Williamson and we've had a little chat about it. I hope you find it interesting. Hello, yeah. I'm Ruth Williamson. Yes. I'm a doctor and an open water swimmer and I'm really excited that Rachel invited me to talk to her about SIP. Well, thanks ever so much for joining me. It's really great to have you along because I think SIP uh, or swimming induced pulmonary edema is something that most swimmers are really totally unaware of. And yet from what I'm picking up, it's something that could be potentially fatal. So I thought it might be, uh, might be useful to have a little chat with you since um, I think you're gaining a fair reputation in the, uh, in the swimming circles for this and, and almost an agony aunt for people who've had it, would you say? I'm not sure about that, but certainly <laughs> being a mate of mine seems to be a risk factor for uh, having sight. So swimming induced pulmonary edema, it's, uh, it's very rare and it's something to be aware of, although you'll probably never experience it. But if you know a little bit about it, you might keep yourself safe or you might help one of your swim buddies stay safe. So what, um, you're saying it's very rare, what, what actually is it? How would I know that, that that's what was happening to me? So swimming uh, induced pulmonary edema, sight, it's, it's like drowning from the inside. So what happens is that water leaks from within your body into your lungs. If you think about your lungs like bubble wrap, mm -hmm. Uh, there are lots of little pockets of air and then the plasticky bits of the bubble wrap. Those are the membranes that hold all the air in your lungs. And within those, there are some really fine, narrow blood vessels. And when you get sight, water, the water that makes your blood runny, leaks from those into the air spaces in your lungs. And so you literally fill up with water from the inside. So think about your lungs being like a big fluffy cake and sip is like your lungs turn into lemon drizzle cake. Ooh, so blimey. we all love lemon drizzle cake mm, but yeah. you don't want that much gloop in your lungs. So that's what it is. We've got this stuff filling us up from the inside out. How would I feel? It sounds like I'd feel full up but and maybe difficulty breathing. What would it actually feel like or look like? So, so for I think there, there are two types of it. Uh, there's the type that comes on very quickly after you enter the water. And I'll just park that one for the moment. And the one that I suppose most of the people I've spoken to who've had SIP, uh, the, the form they've experienced has been when it's come on gradually. So it's crept up on them. But what they've all reported is it felt harder to take a breath. Some of them have had symptoms of what they thought was asthma and they may be asthmatic and it feels like asthma but their inhaler isn't working or they've reported that they're putting in much much more effort than they normally do and not going as fast or as far as they would normally do so swimming becoming more effortful uh, harder difficulty catching their breather breathing and then in the later stages people have reported to me that they've heard crackling in their lungs so imagine popping candy you know mm -hmm. when you eat popping candy you hear that crackling noise in your mm -hmm. mouth well they're hearing that as they're taking a breath coming in and out whereas if you've got asthma if you you'll hear a wheeze but this is hearing a crackle so those are signs that you need to be out of the water as quickly as possible blimey so uh, i guess so if you're on your own hopefully swimming parallel to whatever you're in you just get out get yourself out and um uh, uh, yeah get out the water and, and take it easy what would i do then would i just take a seat or so so the reason it happens is that the the blood pressure in the circulation that feeds your lungs has increased and the water is leaked in so what you want to do is do things which would re reduce the blood pressure mm -hmm. in that lung circulation and the best way to do that is by sitting up so if you've got someone who's got sip then you want to sit them up and they want to get as much oxygen into their lungs as possible so big breaths really try and fill your lungs and that will help 
push the water back out. You can help that even further by putting pressure about the way you blow out. So you can blow out through a straw, you can blow raspberries, you can just purse your lips. <laughs> Imagine playing the flute or playing the trumpet or something like that. And what that does is just holds your lungs open for a bit longer for, to help push the water back out. That's so you can so you can actively manage it yourself if you're if you're in an okay position with it you can actively reduce it does then the crackling and stuff reduce do you actually feel yourself getting better so so by the time you've reached the crackling stage you're in trouble okay. and you probably need to see to seek help uh, but if you recognize mild symptoms of it then get out of the water, sit up, take some deep breaths, and quite often it will resolve. And so one of the things that we see is people who may have had this, by the time they get to hospital, it's all got better oh. because the body has sorted itself out. Lots of swimmers are very fit, and so the body's really good at fixing itself. Um, so yeah, sit yourself up, uh, take some deep breaths, um, but if you've got to the stage of crackling, and you know, the, once you reach the stage of crackling, you may find that you're losing consciousness. You know, you're, you're in trouble because your ability of your lungs to transfer oxygen is significantly impaired if, it, if it's like a soggy sponge. And so, you know, we've, we've seen swimmers effectively passing out whilst in the water, wow. which is serious. Yeah. Um, which is why, you know, when they do these long marathon swims, you always have an observer, you always have a crew on the boat, and they should be watching you, watching for your stroke rate deteriorating, watching for your stroke quality deteriorating. So yeah, if you're out with your swim buddies, uh, think about, are they swimming how they normally swim? Mm -hmm. Has their stroke fallen apart? And we all know what our stroke's like when, we fall, <laughs> when it falls apart. Yeah. So that's what we're after, really. So we're looking at almost swim failure then, where it's just yeah. not working. Wow, okay. Well, that's, that's some really good indicators and that gives me some heart. Who's it most likely to affect? So you remember that I've said, let's park, uh, park two different types. So there is a type of pulmonary edema that comes on in triathletes. And we have seen, very sadly, there have been a few casualties during triathlons. Mm -hmm. and, and quite often it's people who disappear quite early in that big melee. And what we think is going on there is that uh, the lungs are already constricted because you're wearing a tight wetsuit. Your blood pressure is raised because you're hyped up for the event and you run into the water. Mm -hmm. So you push your blood pressure up even further and then you suddenly go horizontal. So there's a whole load of adaptation that has, ha has got to happen in seconds. Mm. And the normal, you know, the normal freedom of movement of the lungs is restricted. Um, if you've got a bit of cold shock, you might be gasping. And all of that sends up the blood pressure in the pulmonary part of the circulation. So we think that's what's going on in the triathletes, in that acute onset within five minutes of entering the water. The other, in the marathon swimmers, the ultra marathon swimmers, we think, we think the mechanism is more complex. And we've got some thoughts that this may be related to feeding regimes. Characteristically, people have quite a lot of sugar. You know, they have a sugar solution, CNP, one of those things. And you will know if you have a big cake fest, you feel quite thirsty afterwards. Yep. And that's your body is trying to lower your blood sugar levels. And what it does is it makes you thirsty so that you drink water, so there's more water that dilutes the sugar and then you pee it out. Mm -hmm. Again, your body needs to have time to do that. And if you over challenge it, that becomes harder and harder. So that may be a mechanism. And we know that there are some people who are predisposed uh, and some of those people get, have had recurrent episodes of SIP. Uh, and that may be because uh, they've got some very subtle abnormalities either in the blood vessels in their lungs or within their heart that means that the heart is less well adapted to being horizontal for 12 or 24 hours at a time. It's worth knowing that the medical profession is not well cited on this. So 
there are a very a relatively small number of open water swimming doctors and most of us are quite well aware of this but even in quite a lot of emergency departments this is something that's rare it's really rare so I work in a hospital by the seaside and we've seen perhaps two or three cases since I've been working there over the last five or six years so it is rare and so for that reason a lot of medical staff won't have heard of it before and if someone comes in having been in the water, your person in the water, the traditional treatment would be treat them for shock, so lie them down, maybe put their feet up uh, and then give them antibiotics and maybe even give them fluids uh, because that's the treatment for shock. So what we're really keen to do within the open water swimming community is if you have, if you think you may have SIP and you need to go to hospital, please tell the doctor treating you or the nurse treating you or whoever is treating you, I think I may have SIP. Because the treatment for SIP is so very different from the treatment for general shock or general near drowning. And uh, the more people are aware about it, the more people talk about it, the more likely you are to get the treatment that will make you better quickest. The good news is that you get better really quickly from it uh, and most people are completely symptom free within 24 to 48 hours of having had even a serious event. Wow, and, and is there any later hang on from it or do we not know that yet? So no, um, we don't really know. What, if, you've had, if you've had a bout of SIPE that's taken you into hospital, you will no doubt have a whole load of investigations mm -hmm. to check out your heart and lungs. And I think that's worth doing. Uh, even if you've had an episode where you treated yourself, mm -hmm. it's probably worth making contact with your, your GP and saying, I think I may have had this. Do you think I need to do any extra tests? That's given me loads to think about. That, that's really, really interesting. And I, what I like that, that I'm hearing is it sounds like it's an active, uh, there's active research going on. I guess you only get to research the few that happen, but, but those people maybe get quite a bit of interest in them and so we gradually build up a better picture and so hopefully more doctors, nurses and, and first aiders will understand about it. Um, and I guess one of the things that you're doing is speaking to the channel pilots about this sort of stuff and, and educating them. Is there anything special you tell them because they are so very far away from help? It's about making sure that people know the correct first aid. So if for the channel pilots, um, it's about saying, you know, keep it simple. If you think, if you've got someone who is in trouble in the water, get them out. If you can hear crackles when they're breathing, assume it's sipe, and so treat them out on the open deck with plenty of fresh air, sitting up, but do everything else that you would. So get them wrapped up, get them warm, get a hat on, all of those things, but on open deck with lots of fresh air because that will help them. Superb. Well, thank you ever so much Pleasure. for your time. That is really, really helpful. And I'm hoping that this will, uh, that people will pick up on this and will and we'll realize it is something treatable. It's not something to be too worried about because it's so rare, but knowing what we need to do is gonna really help out in the event it happens. So thank you so much for joining me. It's been brilliant. Thanks so much for inviting me. Wow, I don't know about you, but I found that really informative. I really hope that I'm not predisposed to SIP, but I'm pretty confident now that I've got enough knowledge to identify it in myself or someone else, and that I know what to do about it. So I'm gonna keep that at the forefront of my mind. If you enjoyed the video, please give it a like and drop me a comment and let me know in the comments anything you'd like me to tackle in the future and I'll do my best to cover it. Also, if you can, please consider subscribing to my channel because I'd love to have you along and I'll see you next time. Bye.